Welcome back to General Chemistry Chapter 5, Chemical Kinetics. So we're going to start off with 5.1, where we talk about the chemical kinetics, and we're going to start with Gibbs free energy, which is shown with a delta G. And Gibbs free energy determines whether or not a reaction is spontaneous. If we have a positive delta G value, we can determine that it's a non-spontaneous endergonic and the reaction goes from B to A, so it's a reverse reaction that ends with high energy product. So if we look at the graph on the left side, for positive delta G, we can see that it starts low and goes high. And for a negative delta G value, we can determine that it's a spontaneous reaction and it gives off heat, so it's an exergonic, and it favors the forward reaction from A to B and ends with low energy products. So the free energy change of reaction can be shown with delta G reaction is equal to the sum of uh, the delta G of reactants minus the sum of delta G of products. And that's our equation. Moving on to chemical mechanisms, it proposes a series of steps that make up the overall reaction. So the intermediates that we have are molecules that exist within the course of a reaction nor products overall. And the rate determining step is the slowest step and limits the max rate at which the reaction can proceed. So intermediates are the ones that, if when we were to add products, get canceled out. So they're just intermediate, they're not in the final overall reaction. Moving on to collision theory, it states that a reaction rate is proportional to the number of effective collisions between the reacting molecules. For a collision to be effective, molecules must be in the proper orientation, number one, and number two, must have sufficient kinetic energy to exceed the activation energy, which is written with Ea. And the equation we have for that is rate is equal to Z times F, where Z is the total number of collisions occurring per second, and F is a fraction of collisions that are effective. So this is an important equation to keep in mind. And when we move forward to the Arrhenius equation, it's a mathematical way to represent uh, the collision theory that we just talked about. So we have K is equal to AE to the power of negative EA, which from before we know is activation energy over RT. So K is equal to the rate constant, A is the frequency factor, EA is the activation energy, R is the ideal gas constant, and T is the temperature in kelvins. One thing to keep in mind is as you increase K, you will decrease Ea and increase the temperature. So make sure you know the relationship between the different components in this molecule. And you can increase the frequency of collisions by increasing the concentration, which makes sense. So the more molecules of a certain element there are, the higher the chances of them colliding. After this, we'll move on to the transition state theory, which states that molecules form a transition state or an activated complex during a reaction in which the old bonds are partially dissociated and the new bonds are partially formed. So this is kind of the middle state um, where it's not fully formed, but it's not fully dissociated as well. So from the transition state, the reaction can proceed towards products or revert back to the reactants. The transition state is the highest point on a free energy reaction diagram, and the reaction rates are affected by the following. So if you increase reactants, you'll increase the reaction rate, except zero order, because more effective collisions per time. And if you increase the temperature, you also increase the reaction rate because of high particles uh, kinetic energy. And another one is changing the medium. So depending on what medium they're in, if they're easy to flow in this particular medium, um, that will increase it. But if it's a more thick medium where it's restricting their movements, that will decrease the reaction rate. Adding a catalyst can also increase the reaction rate because it decreases the activation energy required for them to um, move forward in that reaction. Next, we have two types of catalysts. So we have homogeneous, that means they're in the same phase as the reactants, and we have heterogeneous catalysts that are in different phases. So next, we're gonna move on to 5.2, where we talk about the reaction rates. 
So reaction rates are measured in terms of the rate of disappearance of a reactant or an appearance of a product. In this general reaction equation, the lowercase letters are the coefficients and the uppercase letters are the concentration of the different molecules that may be present. And this is an equation we can use to determine the rate for the different concentrations. Just take note that the reactants have a negative sign in front of them, whereas the products have a positive sign. And they're over the coefficient times the time. And so rate is equal to moles over liters per second. And moles per liters is actually molarity. So it's capital M over S for seconds. So moving on to the rate laws, we have an equation where rate is equal to K, which is the rate constant, and that's molarity over second like we talked about before, with the concentration of the products and uh, the X and Y being the orders of this reaction. So the rate order is the sum of all individual rate orders in the rate law reaction. Here is an example. So given the data below, find the rate law for the following reaction at 300 uh, Kelvin. So A plus B is equal to C and D. So we know that A and B are reactants. And in this table, we're given uh, the initial concentration values for A, B, and we're given the rate initial value as well. So what we're told is to find the rate order so the first step is for the A concentration, we're going to use trials 1 and 2 because they are constant. So we can find the rate order for B. Because they're constant, we don't need to worry about it. And we look at the difference on how that affects the concentration for B. So that's why uh, we do it this way. So for trial 1 to 2, we know that the concentration of A is the same, but the concentration of B doubles where it goes from 1 to 2. And... When we look at the rate, we see that it goes from 2 to 8 approximately, so that increases by a factor of 4. And we're just going to write rate is equal to b to y, where y is the rate uh, order. So we know that rate increases by a factor of 4, so we're going to write 4. And we know that the concentration of b doubles for um, this, so we're going to write a 2 there. And when we solve for y, we get y is equal to 2. So the rate order for b is 2. Now, to find the rate order for a, we're going to use the two constants for b's. Because b stays the same and that's our neutral or null value, um, we're going to use trials 2 and 3 um, to find the rate order for a. So for trial 2 and 3, we know that a doubles where it goes from 1 to 2 and we know that the concentration of B stays the same because it's 2 and 2. When we look at the rate concentrations it goes from 8 to approximately 16 so we can say that it increases by a factor of 2 and once again we're going to write out this equation on the side here where rate is equal to a to the value of x and x is the rate order for the concentration a. So we know that rate increases by a factor of 2, so we're just going to write 2 there. And uh, A is doubled, so we're going to write 2 there as well. When we solve for X, it's going to be 1. So the third step is to solve for K. And we're going to use the rate equation like we said before. Um, because we know that the rate order for A is 1 and the rate order for B is 2, we're going to write those in. We're going to rearrange the equation for and solve for k. We're going to input the values from any single trial that we like. And for this, I chose trial number 1, just simple. So we have concentration of A, which is 1, concentration of B, which is 1 squared, because we know that the rate order for the B concentration is 2. Um, and then for rate, we're going to go with 2. Once we solve all of that, we get 2.0. Um, 1 over molarity times second. So therefore, the final rate law is rate is equal to 2.0 m to the negative 1, s to the negative 1, and a concentration with the order of 1, and b concentration with the order of 2. And that's our final answer. So zero order reaction 
is the rate formation of C is independent of changes in concentration of any of the reactants. So for the zero order reaction, the change rate of reaction is by temperature or addition of a catalyst. And the K value is a negative slope on a concentration versus time graph where the units of K are molarity per second. And that's the equation below. So when we put the zero order for each, anything to zero is equal to one. So the rate is just the rate constant. And that's that. So moving on to the first order reaction now, they have a non-constant rate that depends on the concentration of the reactants. So the concentration versus time graph is nonlinear, and the K also has a negative slope on a lawn of concentration with A versus time graph. And the units for a first order reaction, the units for K is S to the power of negative one. So down here below, we have the equation for that, where rate is equal to negative delta A over delta T. And that's equal to K with the concentration of A to 1. And the units for K would be S to the power of negative 1. So the concentration of a radioactive substance A would be AT is equal to A initial E minus uh, KT. So A T would be the concentration of A at time E, and A0, or A initial, would be the initial concentration of A, K would be the rate constant, and T would be the time. Moving on to the second order reaction, they have a non-constant rate that depends on the concentration of the reactant as well, and their concentration versus time graph is also nonlinear. However, the K has a positive slope on a 1 over a versus time graph and the units for k in this second order reaction would be one over molarity times second and down below i have the equation for that you can either have rate is equal to k with a concentration of a to the one and concentration of b to the one or you can simply have uh, the constant uh, with a concentration of a to the power of two or that concentration can also be b to the power of two in a broken order reaction, those are the ones with uh, the non-integer orders. And mixed order reactions are those that have a rate order that changes over time. Um, we don't need to really calculate these on the MCAT, but just know that at the beginning, there's high concentration of um, A. And since the rate order changes over time, uh, we will get different K values. So we look at the bottom of this rate equation here where we have K2 plus K3 to, with the A concentration. So in the beginning, the K2 is significantly less than the K3 to the A concentration, and that's the first order. And in the end, as all the reactants are being used up, the concentration of A decreases, and the K2 will become significantly higher than K3 with a concentration of A, and that should give us our second order. And we've reached the end of chapter 5. Um, I'll see you guys again for chapter 6. Take care.